Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in to my video. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how I reverse engineered the uh, vintage Grand Slam baseball sim. Um, for those of you who follow my channel, about two and a half weeks ago, I recorded a video that explained in, in quite a bit of detail how the Grand Slam game was designed. And uh, in that video, I made the statement that I thought uh, Grand Slam uh, defied reverse engineering. Uh, several of you uh, probably know from watching my videos that I've reverse engineered other games, uh, including uh, a game that has a similar design called Batter Up. Yeah, you can watch those videos if you would like. I, I would uh, suggest for today's video, uh, if you haven't watched the other Grand Slam video, it might be worthwhile that you do so. I am going to um, cover some of the introductory material again in this video. I'll try to put a timestamp in the description. So if you want to skip the intro, you can, but I'll also um, try to balance between uh, making this video self-contained versus, um, uh, you know, too much repetition of the prior video. Um, so if you haven't figured that out by now, uh, after recording that previous Grand Slam video, I continued to analyze the game and all of a sudden uh, I, I got the feeling that, that it actually might be able to be reverse engineered uh, in order to make uh, you know my own player cards for the game. Uh, so that's why we're here. I was uh, mildly successful, I guess I'll say. So today I'm gonna document what uh, I did how I did it. I know this is interesting to some of you, maybe more than, than others, but uh, as always, I appreciate your watching. Um, like, like and subscribes are good, uh, but uh, comments about uh, the video are, are, are probably the most important uh, to help all of us in our uh, gaming journey. So I'm going to use some slides again today, like I do in some of my other videos, but I'm also going to have my computer on in the background it's just much more efficient uh, to do so. So um, with, that, with that background, uh, a little bit more introduction. I've shown this slide before, but there's some key considerations when you're reverse engineering a sim. Um, you know, the, the most important one today is what's the original sim accurate? And without going into too much detail about what that might mean, uh, I want to say that I assumed in this work that the original sim was accurate. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some testing I did for that theory later, but I, uh, due to the complexity of the game and the way it's designed, I, um, I did make you know the the assumption that that it was indeed accurate. Um, and, you know, I guess I asked the rhetorical question, what do you do if you think the original sim was not accurate? In this particular case, I would have stopped the process. Um, you know, I also think it's important to try to maintain the, the original um, sim's feel or, or you know, the, the, the spirit of how it was designed given the tools that they had at the time. And then uh, do you add any new features or homebrews in this case, I did add a couple of new features, as you'll see at the end. And then um, importantly is testing the results, which I've uh, done only a limited amount of that because again, I made the assumption that the original SIM was accurate. Um, you know, obviously in order to reverse engineer a SIM, you've got to understand how the game engine was designed, you know, how the dice probabilities work. I talked about that in the last video. Um, you know, try to understand the, the rules and the charts. Uh, there's a lot of that to be done here with Grand Slam. Look at the card contents and the layouts of the cards, and of course, set up a spreadsheet. Uh, this was no different, but there's a lot of analysis and logic uh, required, a little bit of trial and error, uh, at times perhaps divine inspiration, and the most important probably uh, is persistence. So with that, um, let's talk about Grand Slam briefly. 
So if you didn't watch the last video, uh, Grand Slam is similar to the Sports Illustrated Baseball or Batter Up you see on the bottom where you roll first on the pitcher chart or pitcher card. If there isn't a result uh, because of that roll, then you move on to the batter uh, card, card or chart, roll again, and then you get a final result. And Grand Slam works the same way. So um, one of the things I did as I went along from a process standpoint is as I studied the cards and the charts, I created a Word document, which you, know, you can kind of see in the background, and I started documenting as I learned things, I, I started documenting things. Uh, at some point, I thought maybe this, this document uh, would get cleaned up uh, to help people who are going to use the spreadsheet in the future. That may happen. Um, but, you know, I'm old and forgetful, and so I thought it would be useful to, to just write some of this stuff down. So I, a, a big step here is just to analyze the game, as I said. And as I mentioned in the last video, one of the complexities of, of this game, and I'm sorry that this isn't very visible, but once you get a result either off the pitcher card or the batter card, uh, you first go to this index uh, chart. Uh, it's numbered 1 to 46 down the left-hand side, although not all the numbers are used. Then across the top are the bases, uh, runners on base situations and the out situations. And then you read a number off of that, and then you turn around and get the final number off of one of these, uh, off this uh, play chart, one of these 96 different, different options. Um, there's also a separate error chart for when there's an error check and a separate range chart, which is another aspect of defense. Um, so those are the charts. Uh, I think I mentioned in the last video, I know I mentioned in the last video, there are a ton of features in, in Grand Slam and a wide range of ratings in most cases. So, um, you know, you have to program, uh, figure out and program all these features in, into, the, into the spreadsheet. So what did I do? One of the things I did is I studied the cards a lot. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I took that... Uh, combination index and result chart and summarized it into one master chart. And as you can see, there's a lot of patterns here. Uh, I've color coded it, but the hits are numbered one to nine, walks are, are index number 10. Um, you see, for example, index number 13 is where you get your wild pitches. Uh, but if there's no runners on base, then uh, they, they make it a strikeout. They could have just as easily made it a re-roll. They did the same thing with past balls um, and and so on. Now you see where my thumb was, was covering up. One of the things I figured out is that number 17 to 20 is gets you to a result where it can be a follow-up, which I've marked here, but it also could be a, an adjustment uh, for a split. Uh, if it's, you know, righty versus righty or lefty versus lefty or what have you. So, um, yeah, so it wasn't enough just to do that, though. I'm going to bring up my Excel spreadsheet, so bear with me. So you see the same thing in the background. Um, every one of these columns in this chart has a likelihood of occurring. And what do I mean by that? So... In, in baseball, bases are empty about 55% of the time, and there's somebody on base, then 45% of the time, obviously, runner on first is, is the next most common at 18%. But then even with within those um, runner on base situations, there are uh, likelihoods of how many outs there are as well. And so... I went to Baseball Reference got uh, for 1979. I got the, the occurrence uh, of, of all those. And um, that was very important because then what I did with this colorful chart is I said, well, if, uh, then let me pick a, a number, but if uh, 23 is, is the, the index result, uh, with bases empty, it's a pop-out 
and then uh, with a runner on second, it's either a pop out or a line out. But in most of the other situations, um, at least when there's a runner on first, it's a it's a double play. If there's no runner on first, it's just a regular ground out. And so what I did over here on the right is I created a table with the various results across the top. And then based on the percentages that I previously discussed, I filled in this matrix. So if, for example, if there's a 23 result, index result, um, the way the chart's designed is 3% of the time, it's gonna be, it looks like a fly out. No, I'm sorry, a line out. 61% um, of the time, it's gonna be a pop out. 17% um, of the time, it's gonna be a regular ground out. And 19% of the time, it's gonna be a ground ball. And I did that for the entirety of, of all the charts. Uh, the reason why I did that will become apparent in a minute because this is basically a big lookup table. So, as I mentioned in the other video, the other thing I did was um, created a spreadsheet over here to summarize uh, the results of an individual card. So the dice probabilities are over here on the left. Uh, there's 1,296 possibilities when you have four dice added together. Um, and each player card, which player cards look look like this. Each player card had two columns of results, very much like uh, modern APA cards have. So I had to type in the results for column one and column two. And then what I did over here is I wrote these look these these uh, formulas to go look up uh, the number of chances that um, resulted from the, the various um, uh, index results that were typed in. And this is all automatic. So if I, if I type a, a 12 here on cell uh, F17, that's a strikeout result. And what you can see is automatically the other results go away and the, the strikeout, 125 chances for strikeouts come up. And so I, I did all that. Um, and, um, you know, I summarized column one on the left in the blue and column two in the peach color on the right. I added them all together and ended up with a summary of the chart. Um, and then what I did is I proceeded to analyze a bunch of pitcher charts and a bunch of batter charts. So when I, when I summarized those individual charts, I, um, not to get ahead of ourselves, but I went ahead and put them in a summary tab. And the idea here was I wanted to see what patterns arose. So for example, except for switch hitters, I could see that um, every uh, batter card mm -hmm. had exactly 35 chances uh, attributed to the split or the split check. So, um, so I did that. And I did that for pitchers as well. And that was very helpful in terms of understanding what's going on. Um, I had recognized before I had done a lot of this work uh, that from a game design standpoint, there were some high level, um, some high level um, uh, patterns, if you will. And one is the case that um, the uh, pitchers had a lot of uh, outs on them, and, and in particular, the pitchers had a lot of um, ground outs on, on the chart, as you can see here. Um, so, 
Likewise, you know, it, if you have a batter chart, um, um, you see that a lot of the strikeouts end up on the batter chart, uh, and all the hits, except for a very small number of home runs, end up on the batter chart. This is completely different from how Sports Illustrated and Batter Up are designed. Um, in the case of those two games, the batter chart, uh, you could pretty much take his actual stats and slice them up and put them on the chart in the same proportion as their actual stats. And the assumption is that, that they're facing kind of the average pitcher. A grand slam is completely different in the sense that there's this imbalance, uh, if you will, uh, between the batter chart and the, and the pitcher chart. And that's one of the reasons why I initially said uh, I couldn't reverse engineer this game. So um, with that, it's like, what do you do with all this data? So what I did, and this happens to be the pitcher summary, is I put in the stats that correspond to the, uh, to the players that I analyzed and I got that from Baseball Reference. And then what I proceeded to do is try to correlate um, various metrics I came up with uh, to the number of actual chances that, that are on uh, the, the card. So the column I've highlighted here is walks. So I went over here. And I calculated a actually a net walk uh, statistic, which is um, total walks minus intentional walks. I divided that by something I call adjusted plate appearances and got a percentage. And then what I did is uh, I said, well, okay, for 7.8% uh, walk rate, they had 28 walks on their card. Uh, and I did that for a whole bunch of players. And as you can see right here, uh, I correlated the walk chances on the card to the walk rate. And in this case, it was about a 92% uh, R squared, 0.92. So I was encouraged because, and, and I'm not surprised, but I was encouraged because there is a correlation between their walk rate and, and, and what ended up on the card, and it's a pretty tight correlated correlation. There were a couple of exceptions, uh, and so I excluded some, a couple of the outliers. Uh, I debated uh, what the situation was, but the main thing was if, if they had a walk rate of less than 4.5%, then they got no walks on their chart. I noticed that. And so I just automatically uh, excluded those so that for the rest of the players, I would get a good, good formula. So I did this for um, walk chances, strikeout chances. Uh, I developed a metric to figure out how, how they put home run chances on the, the pitcher card, uh, hit, hit batsman, and wild pitch. So um, the, the next thing I had to do, though, is figure out how they put hits, or in, in the case of the pitcher, how they put outs on the card. And what I figured out was that there was a correlation of batting average against for the pitcher versus the outs that ended up on the chart. Now, the correlation is only um, 0.83, but visually you can see that it was a pretty good correlation. And so once I had all, all six of these items, then I knew I could solve for, uh, for anything else. Um, actually, I needed, in the, pit, in the pitcher card, I needed to solve for the number of chances that pass over to the, to the batter. Um, this was encouraging, and at this point I knew uh, I could reverse engineer the game. I did the same thing for batters. Um, and without going into too much detail, I, um, come up with the same, um, 
same correlations and they're pretty tight. Here I correlated um, the, the batter's batting average with the number of hits that they had on their card as opposed to the pitcher where it was the number of outs. Um, the only problem with this approach, and I'm going to digress for a second, is that uh, in the case of batter up, I actually had a mathematical formula that I came up with doing some algebra uh, that told me how many uh, outs or hits, as the case may be, to put on the um, um, uh, on the pitcher card. And I used some algebra to get there. So ideally, I would have wanted for the pitchers here to have used algebra instead of this correlation. And so what I did is uh, one night, it was late, and I was, I was busy. I'll just show you an example of some of the, some of the kind of crap that I went, went through. But I was busy scribbling away, trying to find the formulas that would work. And to be honest, um, either I was tired or, um, or, you know, my algebra just isn't what it used to be. You know, here's another example. And, and I was just, you know, I struck out, to be honest. I came up with an answer that made, made no sense. Um, in the end, what I ended up doing, like I said, is using this, um, this correlation, as you see. So, you know, I'm not technically reverse engineering the, the game in, in the most technical sense, but what I'm doing is um, mimicking the original game. And so once I had uh, that correlation figured out, I had to turn the formula inside out so that I could put it in uh, the spreadsheet uh, and uh, take the, you know, figure out the, my metric, um, do some math, some simple math actually, and uh, that would solve for the number of hits to put on, to put on the card. Um, real quick, the other thing that that this analysis showed me was that within the types of outs that that there were, how were they split up um, between fly outs, li line outs, pop outs, ground outs, and double play ground outs, and I, I came up with with an average. Uh, for each of those, for both the pitchers and the batters, and I, I used those later. So, um, yeah, so, you know, what I ended up doing then is I ended up, for both the pitchers and the batters, I went back to this uh, chart construct, and I actually built the same formulas to compute how many chances of the various types to put on the card. And I did that for pitchers and batters. You can see I have a lot of input areas uh, here for, um, for baseball reference data. And I have all kinds of calculations I need to do uh, on the left-hand side here uh, in order to um, have the various various ratings. Um, and I had to do a, a lot of offline analysis for um, purposes of, of creating these ratings. So I talked in a separate video about how I did the jump rating. Uh, the pitcher has a hold rating, which can influence stolen bases. I co-opted that from the batter up work I did. Uh, I had to figure out what split number to put on the chart. Um, because um, of the four split results, two are for pitchers and two are for batters. And within those two pairs, uh, the, the split result that you put on the chart depended on whether somebody was right-handed or left-handed. So I did that. Uh, I figured out how the injuries worked, which were basically on games played or innings pitched for pitchers. Um, each, there's a home run rating. I had to figure out those and to figure out a metric for that. Uh, and then I spent a lot of time on fielding. I probably spent the better part of a day or maybe two on fielding. And it's better if I illustrate this on a batter card. 
but essentially if you put in the fielding data from baseball reference all the fielding ratings update automatically and not only that there's an automatic uh, computation of what uh, how the how the fielding is going to be portrayed on the final card so um, it's it puts their position uh, their rating for errors their rating for range their rating for double plays and then I added also uh, the number of games played now this is entirely automatic but to get there I had to build these complex lookup tables uh, in addition to the calculations for the catcher's arm and the catcher's, or the outfielder's arm and the pass ball rating for the catchers, which is kind of unique uh, in some respects for, for this game. Um, so uh, there is a lot of time and effort and logic put into, into this, uh, all, all in the sense of making it somewhat automatic if you uh, if you just put in this information uh, from baseball reference. The other thing I did for um, for this spreadsheet that I've done on others, I subscribed to uh, what's called card viewer from Stratomatic. and um, so for defensive ratings, I tend to uh, rely on Strat's defensive ratings as a, as primary over anything I calculate. Um, so if I have their defense rating, like in this case, this third baseman, Brookens, has, has a two, I'll put that in there, and then that will override uh, these ratings that are calculated. Same thing for uh, the, the catcher's arm rating or the outfielder's arm rating. If you type that in, it will supersede uh, whatever I calculate in, in the spreadsheet. Uh, same thing for running speed. I type that in and it'll override the running rating and the bunting rating as, as well. It's fortunate for bunting that Grand Slam uses the same A through D uh, scale as, as Strat did. So um, a lot of work there. Uh, and, and what I ended up doing is I ended up actually building a team, which is the... Uh, 1984 Tigers, a team that I've never looked at closely, but pretty famous for, I think, going 35 and 5 at the beginning of the season. So I created these card templates. They're automatically linked via formulas to uh, the individual player tabs. I found a shortcut for doing that linking, which saved hours and hours and hours of time. Uh, so I was able to crank out the this team in, in, in reasonably short, short order, and another team would be really easy uh, to, um, to crank out. The other thing I did is on pitchers, I added a stamina rating for both starting and relieving. Um, in turn, and it's expressed in terms of batter's face. That was not in the original game, but I think that's a, that's a good add. Um, there's probably a few other, other things I did as, as well. And I put a lot of statistics on these cards, um, which I think it's kind of interesting and useful when you're playing a game. I'm a big proponent of using team colors on cards. And uh, since I'm not selling this, I, I feel okay putting the team logo on there as well. And then I'm also a fan of um, team cards. And uh, so there's a lot of basic data about the team. They were number one in runs scored and number one in ERA. Uh, a lot of times when I'm doing cards, I'll put the player picture on the card. In this case, I uh, just grab the, the array of pictures from baseball reference and put it across uh, the cover of the team card. I have 17 batters programmed here, and I forget, but I think uh, 12 pitchers, which at least for vintage era is, is more than enough more than enough cards. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, and uh, I know this is going long, but I, I just want to be thorough, is I talked about testing. And one of the things I did was I created what I call a matchup tab. And 
so what I did, you saw earlier that there was a summary uh, of what's on the card. And I've highlighted it here for uh, McGregor the pitcher. And I've highlighted it here for Stargell the batter. If you copy and paste the summary of their card in, into this, this row, um, it will actually calculate down here what that matchup would produce in terms of a batting average, slugging percentage, uh, walk percentage, etc. And um, it currently does not properly do the splits, although I did go ahead and create a summary of how the, the splits work when, when they apply. Sometimes they'll result in a hit instead of a foul out. Other times, uh, if it occurs on the pitcher card and there's no split adjustment, or if there is a split adjustment, uh, instead of a foul out, it's, a, it's a, just a roll over onto the batter's card. Um, and then there's some home run adjustments and, and some other stuff that, that I didn't, uh, didn't adjust for. But this is very useful to determine whether or not it, it feels or looks like uh, either the original cards or the ones that I make were um, were indeed accurate. And I actually did one here where I, I calculated the average um, batter card based on the ones that I've analyzed so far. It may or may not be the league average, but uh, in any event, I did an average batter. And I lined it up against McGregor and, you know, it came out and said that that he had a batting average against a 232 and a slugging against a 414. Well, um, actually, his actual batting average against was 248. So, you know, that's uh, an indication that maybe the pitcher card's a little too strong. Uh, I wouldn't consider this to be definitive. The slugging percentage is, is a little bit closer. 392 versus 414. Um, this gets me back to the very beginning where I said, you know, one of the things that I did in this reverse engineering project is to um, assume that the original game was accurate. Uh, this at least proved to me that it's directionally accurate. And, and so that was, you know, all I wanted, all I wanted to do. Um, just in terms of the programming behind uh, the spreadsheet, there are a ton of tables, most of them related to fielding, but there's a ton of tables that are, that are in this spreadsheet uh, in order to assign all the ratings that you need to assign. And I had to build all these tables. And behind all these tables, there's actually um, a lot of work done particularly in the fielding error area. Um, if you bear with me one second, um, there's a whole supplemental fielding spreadsheet that I did where I took um, each position. I, I have a tab for each position. So I started with catchers and so on. And one that I tried to do is determine if there was a relationship between a metric that I came up with and the rating that was assigned. And the short answer is that errors are entirely based on fielding percentage, which might be okay because they have a separate range rating and a separate um, double play rating, at least for the infielders. And so I did my, my correlation analyses and you can see that there's a high correlation between the fielding rating and fielding percentage, I could come up with no correlation for range. And I, I even looked at the, the statistic uh, range factor per nine, and, and that didn't prove anything. Um, I looked at some others, other statistics. Um, what I ended up doing for range, uh, if, if, the, uh, if the strat rating wasn't wasn't available. I, I think I just defaulted to the middle, which is a B um, for range. And then for double plays, I actually um, came up with another correlation 
uh, based on double plays per inning. And here we go, double plays per inning. And what I ended up doing for assigning those ratings is just uh, compute the average, compute one standard deviation, and then use that as the defining, defining range for double plays. Um, I think it works. It, it gives some answers sometimes that are not intuitive, but, but so be it. Uh, this has gone on a long time. I wanted to be thorough. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that there was a lot of work behind this. Uh, some of it I just showed you on the spreadsheet, but here's an example of when I was analyzing the range rating table and how that worked. Uh, I went through and uh, tried to figure out how the uh, range ratings were distributed between A, B, and C. Uh, of course, B is the most common. Uh, I also um, wanted to figure out of the various out types, uh, what are the subtypes or which, which specific um, index numbers were uh, used by pitchers and by batters. And actually what I ended up doing instead of this piece of paper version is I created a tab in the spreadsheet to summarize uh, in the 21 through 46 range, which, which result numbers were, were used um, in terms of, uh, in this case, the batters, their ground outs were in 24 to 33, uh, and the fly outs were in 37 to 39. In the case of the pitchers, they use different numbers, as you can see in the yellow here, and um, and so I actually documented how, how these were distributed. Uh, I determined that within these subtypes, there weren't a lot of patterns. And quite frankly, and, and I should mention this, thank, uh, God bless you if you're still with me. But, you know, once the spreadsheet calculates the results, then you have to go take the results, uh, which are on this target line here, and you have to go back up and put result numbers in this um, matrix to produce a chart or a card that minimizes the, the differences between what you think should be on the card, so-called target, and what is actually on the card. And that is a lot of trial and error. I got better at it. Um, as I went along, you cannot be perfect, um, but given the way the dice probabilities are designed, uh, they're very thin probabilities at the two ends and very high probabilities in the middle. It is really hard to be as precise as you might like to be. Some, some cards worked out really well and some cards, um, I still had some errors, particularly within the types of outs uh, that you had here. Um, and, and on that, maybe I'll do one, one final nuance. I thought the original game didn't have this, but I thought it would be useful for batters to um, to actually customize the double play uh, chances. But what I've found is that even though I calculated whether they should be overweight or underweight double plays, I was having a real hard time isolating out um, the double plays because um, just because of the way the the way the results uh, are to, are defined on on the original charts, maybe maybe one final final thought. Uh, one of the things I looked at is you know they were very generic in the way they assigned um, split results, other than what I already described. Um, and so one of the things I put in the spreadsheet is just a, a summary of the split data. Um, which you can kind of see to the right of this highlighted area. And one of the things I had the spreadsheet calculate is, you know, were there splits on a batting average basis uh, co the conventional way, you know, where lefties versus lefties and righties versus righties perform better. And in this case, this was a conventional split. And then I calculated the batting average difference. 
There are a few players where the splits are opposite. Could be a function of being one, only one team, or I'm sorry, only one season, small sample size, and then the, the degree of variance uh, in real life uh, for the splits uh, can, can, be, uh, can be a wide range. So in the future, if, if, the, if the splits were unconventional and you wanted to reflect that, instead of an automatic split number, you could type in uh, the opposite number and it would, it would be reflected um, on the chart. I did not do that. Uh, I went with a generic approach, but uh, okay, I've gone on too long. Uh, thank you if you've made it this far. Uh, I know there's a, probably only a few of us that, that love all this stuff, but I wanted to document what I did. Uh, this information can be found uh, regarding the game, can be found uh, on a Facebook page that is currently called uh, Astra Batter Up, um, which you can see here. Uh, that name of the group might change, but um, for the moment, um, that's how you can search for it. And all the components of Grand Slam 1980 edition are there in the files section. Uh, my contact information is at the bottom here. Again, look forward to hearing from you either in the comments or, or directly through one of these channels. Thanks again for watching. Take care. Bye.